I'm here with Megan. I can call you that, right? You can. <laughs> okay. <cool. laughs> and I'm looking at this camera that I'm conflicted about, and we'll discuss that today. It is a Fuji GA645. It's a, an autofocus fixed lens rangefinder. I just hit my microphone. Autofocus fixed lens rangefinder medium format camera. So um, I'll do some voiceover, and you can watch me shoot photos. <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea of rangefinder film cameras. I've owned a handful and they're really great cameras, but there's a particular issue with them that continually bugs me. That said, I still give them as many chances as I can, and that brings us to the Fujifilm GA645. Introduced in 1995, the camera is a medium format film camera with a fixed lens and a rangefinder style experience. It's basically a super fancy point and shoot, but it's medium format. It shoots the 645 ratio, which is six centimeters by 4.5 centimeters. But let's look back on a couple of sessions so we can get a feel for how it is in action. So let's see. I'm here in the unspecified woods. It's super hot and this dress is made of polyester. <laughs> so Kodak Gold 200 is gonna be my First thing, I've never loaded this camera. I've never shot it before. I just got it the other day. Traded one camera for it. Um, camera's off. Okay, here it goes. And, okay, that's good. How am I supposed to step? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. I'm using this uh, shoe here because there's no flash uh, socket. 200 ISO. Okay. Um, now I'm gonna cut the fancy B-roll explaining this while we set up the shot. Cool. The shoe I was referencing was the Flash Hot Shoe, by the way. It doesn't have a built-in PC socket. Yeah, it, the self-timer was on for some reason. And for the Flash Averse, the PC socket is a cord that goes either to a remote or a flash to trigger that remote or flash for use of remote flash which is what I'm doing here, by the way. The light was terrible because it was around noon and it was uh, very contrasty. So I decided to use a flash because the GA645 has a leaf shutter lens and it is capable of syncing up to 1 700th of a second, which is really wild for flash synchronization. Though there are certain limitations to that. You may have heard me say that I triggered the self timer button, which can be a little easy to do, but I haven't done it since. So I'm not sure if it's a problem. First roll was a little, a little awkward, but not bad. It says to turn it off after that, and then open it. Push this to release the film. All, all nice and easy so far. Like I said, it was a little awkward to use on the first roll or two. It's definitely more geared toward using it in program than anything else, but it doesn't take long to get the hang of everything. But Alex Soth in a recent Analog Talk interview highlighted the thing that bothers me most about this or other rangefinders and rangefinder style cameras, namely that you don't see the actual focus of the lens. Obviously you don't see through the lens itself because it's not an SLR. So while the framing is saved generally by excellent parallax correction, there's no indication of if you got the area you want in focus or not. It focuses on the center or you hit the manual focus button to lock focus and then recompose. And that's really all you get, which to me is a problem. Okay, that's the end of that roll. So this would be like an autofocus rangefinder, and then there's manual focus rangefinders like Leica's with a little rangefinder patch. And that can help you spot your focus as you recompose, but nothing really beats an SLR or at least a view camera or something with a live focus view. 
for truly understanding the separation and depth of your image. I'll probably backlight you. I'm gonna switch this around so I can. So we're on to another session to get a better feel for this. One thing about this camera is that it automatically shoots in a vertical orientation while most cameras are horizontal. I love it. Go ahead and stand out more so the sun's all on your back. Ooh, the, house, the light's bouncing off the house really good. I like it because I shoot most of my stuff vertical orientation, which makes me weird, but... And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and show in the viewfinder a little bit too. Okay. This is my sophisticated viewfinder recording system. There you go, okay. So if I can see it, you can see the readout there in perfect non-focus, there we go. You can actually read those numbers in the, okay, I'm gonna try to get this. And you see how it corrects for parallax error, which is cool. The other thing is with this format is you get 16 shots per roll instead of like 12. Yeah, more on that in a minute. We can get out of direct sun for a minute. <laughs> If it's not tree or bush, I don't know what it is. Not at all because of color film prices right now. I was shooting FOMA 320 Retro. Hold. Quiet. Yeah, it's really quiet because there's no flapping mirror. You can hand hold it at slower speeds than you could normally. And that lack of mirror is also why it's really nice and compact, which is a major plus for me. Actually, I only got 16 on this roll, 15 on this roll. Sometimes you get 16, but... Yeah. So yeah, I got 15 shots on that roll. I'm not completely sure why it sometimes doesn't get 16 shots per roll, but that was the only roll I've gotten 15 frames on, so there's that. Another issue I have with viewfinders like this is that I backlight a lot, and sometimes I have the sun directly in the photo. It makes it hard to predict the flare, but in general backlight situations, just raise your exposure by 1.5 stops, and it should look pretty good. And from here, I shot a roll of the desperately needed to return Ultra Fine Extreme 400, which is some derivative of Ilford film. That mystery remains, but hopefully we'll see it again one day because it's a really lovely film. And I'm down to, I think, my last roll after this. So this is a little less grainy, a little more contrasty than the FOMA turned out. Although I do have a favorite film from this session and Amazingly, it's not the ultra fine, even though I do really like this. As far as ISOs go, by the way, on the GA645, it's pretty easy to change them. It's odd where it is because it turns off the camera when you change ISOs, but other than that, it's pretty easy to change and to find. Reading online, you hear a lot of people talking about metering problems with this camera, in manual mode at least, but I haven't really found that even though I have used it a lot in program. Oh yeah, it's the height of innovation in YouTube technology. Granted, I do use the exposure compensation quite a bit, especially backlighting. But I really didn't like these first shots as much as I thought I would, so we'll kind of skip ahead to these later ones, which uh, I think were much more successful. And I was using T-Max 400 at this point. I should probably dedicate a second to the lens, by the way. The lens is 16mm f4, which means you're not going to get like a lot of bokeh or whatever, but it is ultra sharp like Fuji lenses tend to be even to this day. So there's no complaints there. I really like it. It's easy to handhold at slower speeds because of the weight and size and lack of mirror, which helps uh, make up for the f4 aperture being a bit slower. And right now I just have to sing praises of T-Max especially in medium format, T-Max 100 and 400 is just such a beautiful film. A lot of people talk about it looking too digital or too grainless or whatever, but I find that when I develop it in Rodinol, it gives it a tiny tooth, uh, if you could say. But what I really love about it is how it renders tone so smoothly and how it handles contrast. It's just really hard for me to quantify, but it's got a distinctive look that I absolutely love which makes me excited to have a small stockpile of it. Well, how I feel about this, I, I really don't know. There's a lot I like about it. 
The GA645 is a fully capable rangefinder style film camera that shoots 15 through 16 645 frames on medium format film. Despite autofocus quirks and recomposing, it's a solid autofocus performer and the parallax correction is excellent. The vertical viewfinder might bother some, but was a plus for me. The data printout is a nice touch I didn't get to mention. It's a little difficult for me to scan it at the moment, and I missed that from the Pentax 645. If you're someone who is obsessive with seeing depth of field and separation like I am, this is a challenging camera, but its size and extreme quality make it appealing. The image quality is phenomenal and the quirks mostly don't get in my way. I'm still not sure if I'm keeping it, but I think it's worth trying and I especially think we should spend more than a couple shoots with any camera before making a decision about them because we'll learn their quirks and how they work and we'll learn if they can work with us. So that's what I'm doing. So thank you for watching. Thank you to my patrons for supporting this channel. For as little as a dollar a month you can join. It really helps a lot. Don't forget to like and subscribe, turn on notifications, and leave a comment. See you soon.